Profiling System 101 webinar. Steve? Okay, thank you, Brian. Think, On behalf of Federal Highway, I, I think I you're muted, everybody. Steve. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I too. can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Hear you. Okay. You. We're not muted. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So on behalf of Federal Highway, I want to thank everyone for, for calling in today. And a special thanks for Michael Linder and also Brian Prowl and Dennis and Nathan Morian from QES for organizing the webinar. And also to our guest speakers today, Dr. Ray Brown, Kyle Hogue, Di Shontek from Minnesota DOT, and Craig Landefeld from Ohio DOT, and to Rich Giesel, who, although he could not be here today, he took the time to record a presentation for Alaska. So what's the goal of the webinar today? It's primarily to expose you to the dielectric profiling system, but also to share with you some advantages on how this technology might benefit you now, now, and also the vision on how this might be used in the future. Federal Highway and hopefully all of us have a desire for long-term durability and superior performing asphalt payments. And that includes uniformity. Shortly, Dai will provide an overview that includes a little bit of history on the DPS. Uh, it really got its push about 10 years ago with, with uh, Sharp 2, with R06C, a research study conducted by TTI and their study highlighted both IR and DPS technologies were very promising technologies for evaluating asphalt pavement uniformity during construction. From that point, Minnesota, with their research and pool fund effort, and also with their support of the Sharp 2 Implementation Assistance Program and a number of other supporting agencies, industry, vendors, um, We've addressed some initial challenges and saw to a number of improvements to the technology. So what's our goal? Well, at the time we saw DPS as a very useful tool, not only for quality control, but also having the potential for being used for acceptance. And people asked me uh, even yesterday if I thought the DPS technology was ready for implementation. And my answer is, well, it depends. And it depends on what your needs are. And if you want a nice technology to aid in improving density of the mat or along the joint or showing uniformity and want some real time information of the entire pavement area, then the answer is yes. But if you want to use it for acceptance with respect to density, then my answer is it's really not quite there yet. In some states, such as Minnesota DOT are very close, but there are still some challenges to be addressed and questions to be answered. But to get there, part of the challenge is also understanding all of its limitations, and that's where getting more states involved will help. And the last thing I wanted to mention is Federal Highway is a strong partner here. We're at the table assisting Minnesota DOT in advancing this effort, and that that includes supporting research, supporting demonstrations, and positioning us for potential implementation. Federal Highway now has a DPS at Turner Fairbank and is ready to support research. Federal Highway through the Mobile Asphalt Technology Center also now has a small handful of DPS cards and IR scanners for that matter, available for technology demonstrations and loaning out the states if they are interested in doing trials. So even with the pandemic this year, we were able to lend South Carolina and Missouri DPS carts and provide training on how to use it. And we have Massachusetts, Arizona, and Wisconsin on the waiting list to borrow them next. And I hear Massachusetts is looking at borrowing both the IR and the DPS technologies. So if, if you are interested, uh, you can coordinate through your Federal Highway Division offices and they'll let, let, let Leslie McCarthy know. So again, thank you, and I, I think I'll be turning it over back to Brian, who will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ray Brown. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Yeah, Brian, we have a lot of background echo. 
Sorry about that, Steve. Uh, I'm not, I wasn't receiving your audio on my end for some reason, even though my microphone's working. So I had called in on my phone. I've taken care of that now. Uh, so next up we have Dr. Ray Brown, uh, who was my advisor during my PhD and is a, a great mentor and is also a director emeritus from Auburn University or for the National Center for Asphalt Technology. Dr. Brown. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, Steve. It's good to be with you today. And instead of switching back and forth, I only have a few slides. So Brian is going to uh, advance the slide for me while I, while I make the presentation. Uh, we thought it'd be good to share a little bit with you on the importance of in-place density. Uh, much of this is obvious, but I think there's some things that we don't often think about that probably need to be highlighted as we go uh, uh, through these presentations on uh, density. Next slide. So three or four reasons that uh, we really need uh, good compaction. One is to uh, min minimize additional compaction. Uh, once we put asphalt mix down and we start uh, operating on it with trucks and uh, vehicles with relatively high tire pressures, we're going to densify the asphalt, we're going to end up with rutting. So if if we don't get good compaction to start with, the traffic is going to compact it and then we're going to have a problem with rut. So we need to make sure that uh, uh, we get good initial compaction. We want to minimize water permeability. I, I think the biggest issue here maybe is stripping. Uh, if water can penetrate into the asphalt and uh, over time, erode the asphalt from the surface of the aggregate, uh, then we'll get stripping and, and have problems. So we want to make sure that it is watertight. We keep the water out. Third thing uh, is to prevent excessive oxidation of the asphalt mixture. If we have a lot of voids, certainly air can uh, uh, penetrate into the asphalt and through the asphalt. And over time, it's going to quickly oxidize the asphalt, making it much stiffer and more brittle therefore ending up with more cracking, uh, potentially raveling, and loss of fatigue life. So we need to make sure that we can minimize any future uh, excessive oxidation. And then the last one is kind of obvious. Uh, if, if we don't have good compaction, we're not going to have good shear strength. Uh, Rutting is going to be an issue. We'll get plastic flow and other issues. So we need to make sure that uh, uh, we get good compaction so that we do have the strength that we need. Next slide. Another thing we have to keep in mind is uh, we need good compaction, but we need good compaction in all areas. Uh, we probably spend 90% uh, of our time worrying about how we compact the mat, uh, the rolling patterns and that sort of thing and the top mix we're using and so forth. Uh, but we also have a lot of joints that we deal with. We have longitudinal and transverse joints, and this is generally asphalt to asphalt. So if I'm paving two lines of asphalt, I'm probably going to have one joint in between them, and we have to make sure that we, we get good properties there at that joint, good density at that joint. We also have uh, problems with asphalt to concrete issues uh, at bridges, uh, at curbs and gutters. So when we're placing asphalt next to concrete, we have additional issues that we have to be um, aware of. Compaction is going to be difficult, Measuring compaction is going to be more difficult, and so there's a lot of issues. So we have to make sure that we get co good compaction in all these areas and not just spend 100% of our effort on the mat. Uh, uh, the mat is important, but so are the joints. Next slide. So if I look, look at an asphalt pavement, we put traffic on it. Everybody's seen these photos or these types of slides. Over time, we get uh, uh, densification. Then when it rains, we have water in the rut. So it doesn't take a very deep rut for water to stand in it. So the pavement may perform fine, but if we have water standing in the ruts, uh, we've got major issues. So we've got to make sure that we uh, uh, get good compaction initially and we don't have uh, significant issues with this. And by the way, I'll say this, that in recent years, I think we've done a much better job in compacting our pavements 
and uh, solving this particular issue. We still see it from time to time, but not nearly as bad as we did, say, 30 years ago. Next slide. Permeability are, are uh, areas of concern. Uh, when we first went to superpave, we started using coarse graded mixes. Uh, we started designing it at very high gyration levels. Uh, we ended up putting some mixes down that were a little bit on the dry side. They were difficult to compact. And the bottom line is we ended up with pavements that tended to be a little bit porous. And so during the rainfall, water would uh, seep into the pavement. And then over a period of time, uh, it would stay inside the pavement and under traffic, of course, it could erode the uh, asphalt from the surface and lead to stripping. So this was a big issue when we first started with super paves. Changes have been made, not nearly as big of an issue now, but it was a big problem. Next slide. So if we look at uh, some old pavements, uh, hopefully we don't see many of this bad. Some. Uh, Quite often around the joints, it's permeable to water, and over time we'll see stripping and uh, might see something looks in the condition of the pavement here. Uh, not very good, and I think we would all agree this is not something that's uh, really acceptable uh, for what we're doing. Next slide. Density related uh, performance problems at, at curves and gutters are, are significant. Uh, if we have a, 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 say at a bridge, if we have a concrete uh, bridge and we have asphalt next to it, when we drive across the bridge and on to the far side, we're normally going to tend to push the asphalt, densify the asphalt at that uh, point, and we're almost always going to have a bump. So uh, uh, getting good density at that particular location is, is very difficult because we've got to compact the asphalt without damage in the concrete. And we've got to compact the asphalt in a way that gives us density. And on military airfields, we, we've uh, been using a method that's kind of unique. We require, when we build an asphalt next to concrete, we, we require that the contractor overbuild the asphalt and compact it. This keeps the roller off the concrete, minimizes any damage from the rollers. It also allows you to get full compaction and then we come in and grind the surface next to the concrete. Uh, I, I've seen at least in a couple of states where this had been done. I don't know if it was intentional or it was to correct a problem, uh, but it, that's one approach that has been used to minimize concrete damage and to improve density uh, in the asphalt. Next slide. Longitudinal joint issues, we're all aware of that. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon at all to see cracking and raveling in the joint. Most of the time on highways, the joint is at the center line and uh, it's striped and painted over and it's not such a big issue. Uh, but quite often it ravels back far enough and we have major damage and it becomes a much more uh, significant problem. So longitudinal joints, uh, on highways is a, a very big problem. And most places now, we don't check the density in the joints. A few places do, and I think they have seen improved performance. So if we've got a method that we can check density in the joint, that's certainly going to improve the, the overall performance of, of the joint and the mat. Next slide. Inadequate compaction also leads, leads to oxidation. Uh, we've seen a lot of roads over time that uh, you have cracks run, uh, running randomly, as you see on the left. Uh, occasionally, we see cracks uh, starting to uh, develop underneath the wheel, uh, wheels of the vehicles, as you see on the right. Uh, a lot of times, this is due to oxidation. If, if we have thin pavements, and they oxidize, they become brittle, and cracking is going to be a, a very significant problem. With thicker pavements, this is probably less of a problem, but with thin pavements, this is a, a huge problem that we need to uh, deal with. Next slide. So this is often good in mat areas, but low in adjacent joints. We see this uh, fairly often. Uh, I kind of think of this as a 10-90 rule or the 90-10 rule. 10% 10 of the area uh, is is well is is poorly compacted. 
90% of the area is well compacted and we get good performance in the 90% uh, of the area, bad performance in the 10%. So we, we need to be aware of uh, uh, this particular problem and really spend a little bit more effort around the joints, adjacent to the joints and so forth. Next slide. So good compaction of the asphalt mixture is essential and I'd like to should have underlined this in all areas of the asphalt pavement if we're going to get good performance. So we do have to compact the mat. That takes a lot of effort. We do need to put uh, uh, effort at longitudinal joints. We need to put effort at transverse joints, all areas throughout the pavement if we're going to end up getting overall uh, uh, good performance throughout the, the pavement. Next slide. And that's all I have. Uh, I think there's uh, time for questions later, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Next up, we have Shengtao Dai from Minnesota Department of Transportation, and Shengtao and Kyle Ho lead the uh, pooled fund study on the dielectric profiling system. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, um, Brian. And uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. OK, All right. good morning, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the general overview of the density profiling system and we refer as the DPS system. So what is the uh, density profiling system? The DPS system is nothing else. It's just a grand penetrating radar device. Uh, we call the density profiling system, but actually it does not directly measure the density of asphalt mixture. It measures the dielectric constant of mixture, then we can relate the dielectric constant uh, to the density. So the system we have is, um, is a three-channel GPR system. So each orange box is a GPR unit. So a three orange box in here. So this is three-channel uh, GPR DPS system. Uh, I believe most of you probably, some of you know what is GPR. And GPR is a non-invasive and non disruptive testing tool that has been widely used it, uh, in the industry to map the subsurface conditions, like the archaeology. And they have uh, used quite a bit this technology to detect the underground features. And the military has used this to detect the underground structures and the IED stuff like that. Uh, it operates uh, very similar to the X-ray. So X-ray use the uh, electromagnetic uh, waves to see what's what's inside your body, what's going on inside your body. And this technology use the uh, radio wave and emits radio wave into the ground uh, in our applications into the pavements to look what's inside in the inside in the pavements. So how does GPR work? And like I mentioned before, the each orange box is a GPR unit. But within the each within this box, there is a two sensors. One is called a transmitter, and one is called a receiver. So basically, transmitter emits the wave into the uh, ground, into the pavement. Then, when the wave hits the interface between the two materials in terms of dielectric constant, so the wave does not recognize stiffness of uh, of two different materials, but it recognizes the con dielectric constant of the individual materials. So when the hits interface between the two different materials, in our case, is between the air and the asphalt mixture. So that's the asphalt pavement surface. Then part of the wave will refracted back and the part of the wave will get into the pavement. So once refracted wave received by the receiver, then the receiver reaches a peak value in the time history trace. Just watch the animation of this. Um, this animation. So when it hits the pavement surface, wave refracted back and received by receiver, and then register a, a peak value and recorded time history trace. So if I put this time history trace in the transverse way, so it's very it's similar like this. So this is a surface refraction, the peak, this is a curve, this is a time history trace, this amplitude is from pavement uh, surface refraction. So what we are interested in is this peak value, or sometimes you can use a trough from this time uh, from the surface uh, refraction. So we can use this peak value and using this formula to calculate the actual constant. In this formula, we have the A0, which is the uh, amplitude from surface refraction, and AP 
its amplitude from the metal plate calibration data. So before we take the actual uh, survey, take this DPS device to get the project uh, survey, take project data, we have to do metal plate calibration. So basically we place the metal plate underneath antenna and we take static measurements. Uh, as we know, metal is perfect refractor. So any wave hits on the metal plate will 100% refract it back and you will get a very clear signal from metal plate. So we can easily to find this uh, amplitude from metal plate refraction. So we, after we got these two parameters, then we can use this formula to calculate the dielectric constant of S4 mixture. Um, back to the DPA system. The system we have Could, I, is, could you switch your slides to presentation mode, please? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. I See if we can get the animation or movie. It's better? Sorry. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so, so, um, so the DPS system uh, we have is a three channel system. And so each orange box is a one DPS units. And you can get a one channel, two channel, or up to three channel system. The, the one we have is the GSSI uh, unit, but you can get the, the uh, similar units from other vendors like the sensors software or earth science the, the also produce similar uh, system. Uh, using the GPA, GPR device to mapping the asphalt compaction density and the uniformity is not our idea and actually is product of SHOP2. And SHOP2 did the research back in the 2013 and also 6C and they evaluated the different type of equipment and they found the GPR is the most promising technology that it can be used to uh, mapping, get a continuous uh, mapping of the asphalt compaction and also uh, uniformity. Uh, also, they found the dietary constant measured from the, from the GPR device can be directly related to the density or, or air voids from the, um, the asphalt mixture. And this is actually is the um, the, the published report, this is uh, the uh, front page of the report, and you can easily find this uh, report online. So after 2013 research is done, after the funded GPR is the most uh, promising technology and can be used for mapping the S4 compaction uniformity and the density. So they initiated um, implementation of system program back in the 2015. So the, the objective of this implementation of this program is to, um, to financially or tech, tech, uh, and also tech, technically support the, some states to further evaluate this technology and towards to the implementation. So at that time, uh, main DOT, Nebraska DOT, and the MINDA, we, we joined uh, this, the program, and the University of Minnesota uh, was the principal investigator of the program, and the Federal Highway and Ashto and the CH2 uh, M Hill was were part of the program too. So the motivation: Why do we need to use the, the DPS to evaluate the asphalt compaction? And um, just Dr. Brown just to talk about the importance of, of density effects and the payment performance. And um, actually, there was study done by the Washington DOT back in the 1989 that quantified the. Uh, Density effect on the as for uh, and the payment performance. So they found one percent increase in the air voids. If air voids uh, is greater than seven percent, it tends to reduce the payment of life by by ten percent. That's quite a bit uh, payment of loss, payment of life loss. And often we see there's the uh, the failure and the as for payments starts from localized failure, so from potholes. And actually, this happens quite a bit in, in the springtime in this time of year in Minnesota. So we believe uh, part of the reason of this pothole uh, was because of the lack of density at this particular location. So in this, if you don't have enough density, there's a permeability in this location is high. So water can easily get, get into this uh, um, in the payment at this location. And after several free saw cycles, then it, then it forms the pothole. So once you a uh, traffic drive on top of the, of this pothole, then generates huge dynamic loading. Then very quickly 
it propagates to a big area of failure and the and that's for payment. And also Dr. Brown mentioned about the 1920 joint failure and this also one of the uh, uh, major failures um, in our asphalt payments in Minnesota. And again, so once the water gets into this 92 joint, the gaps, the gap, then uh, after several free saw cycles, it, it can cause um, 92 joint totally failure and big area failure. So right now we're taking cores uh, to evaluate the compaction. And cores are taken from isolated locations and spot locations. First of all, it's destructive and also does not give you um, total picture, compaction picture of the payments, does not give you continuous measurements of, of uh, uh, compaction uh, density and as for payments. So that's prom promoted us to look at the different technology like GPR um, to uh, for the get the continuous assessment of as for compaction and hopefully get the full coverage of as for compaction. Uh, and like I mentioned before, and GPR does not give you the density and directory. It's measured directly constant of the of the asphalt mixture, but we need to relate related the directory constant to the density. The way we do it is through the calibration. Um, previously, we are using the field core for established calibration curves. Um, the, fit, the, the way we did is after compaction is done, after we collect the DPS data uh, after finish, behind the fancy roller, then we select the high and the low dash constant locations on the field. Then we took the static dash constant measurements on those locations. Then we, then we extract the core on those locations. Then we measure the density in, in the laboratory. Then we know the dash constant on those locations and also the density. So then we can release the measured the dietary constant to the, the uh, to the density. So this figure um, it shows the uh, uh, two calibration curves we got from the field core and the two mineral test sections. One is the 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 uh, um, orange one was the limestone mixture and the blue one was the granite mixture. You can see the limestone mixture has shifted up um, from relative to the, the um, blue uh, calibration curve. That is because the limestone have high dietary constant than the granite. So you can you can see the shift. So what does it mean? This means when we do the calibration, we have to be very careful and accurate the type. And because the, the dietary constant measurements is very sensitive to the, the, dietary, the accurate type in the mixture. Um, it worked for us, but you can see the data is um, is a little bit scattered from the field core. Uh, so during the uh, research, and some people uh, mentioned that can we use a geometry box to establish calibration curve. I mean that was a great idea. Uh, if we can do it, let's simplify our life quite a bit. Uh, first of all, we can easily to um, to manufacture the uh, box. Uh, at the different um, air voice content or different density level, because we can do deep level, we can change the um, gyration uh, number, or we can uh, change the amount of material put in the mold to get the different the density or different air voids um, pox. But if we can measure the dietary constant on this pox, then we can now we're in business. We can we know dietary constant on each pox, and we know the density on each part, and then we can easily establish this calibration curve in the laboratory. And also the advantage of this doing this is we can establish establish this curve ahead of paving. So we can do this at the early in the morning and before paving starts. So once we find this calibration curve, we can we can input this that this calibration coefficients into the uh under the software, then we can evaluate the density and the and the project and the project and not give the not just give the rates the dash constant but okay instantaneously 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 to see the density on 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 the project so we worked with gsi and gsi and came up a calibration um, method and, and there's a mathematical equation um, and to divide the mathematical equation that we can use the java 3 pox and to establish this uh, calibration curve. And also to, to develop the test toolkit, and this is a test toolkit in here, and it, you can use this test, test toolkit to get the uh, dietary constant from, you know, from each part.
So in terms of field data collection, uh, we do um, two type of data, uh, field data collection. One is the mainline um, data collection, and another is joint data collection. So for the mainline data collection, we just push the cart uh, back and forth behind the fancy roller. I, you can see in the, there's, this is a fancy roller. So we push the cart behind, behind the fancy roller um, back and forth to, to get the DMAT data collection. I'm not sure you can see the video, but this is the, uh, the way we do data collection. Can you see the video, Brian? Yes. Okay, yes, Ty. So then that's very good. So then we push back, we take the push it back and the force and try to get the, um, more coverage and the payment. You can do a uh, straight line data collection, or you can do like a cow is doing right now to uh, do swerving uh, data collection. But if you do the straight line data collection, you have to be very careful. That is the because the paving is straight, the paving, straight line paving. So sometimes leave the linear uh, feature um, on the pavements, straight line linear defects on the pavement surface. So if you do the uh, straight line data collection, then you could missing could miss the uh, linear defect feature on the pavement surface. But if you do the swerving test. And um, then you can likely you can cover, you can detect this uh, linear defects, defects on the payment surface. For the, for the joint data collection, um, we place this sensor uh, close to the joint and not directly over the joint. And the, because we place sensor not directly over the joint, because the, like I mentioned before, the, the GPR emits the wave into the payment. But the wave is not straight line, it's the cone shape. Uh, wave. When the cone shaped wave hits the pavement surface, the footprint is uh, is a circle, is close to a circle. So if we place this sensor directly over the joint, then part of part of this footprint will be on the other side of the joint. And sometimes this line is not paved, and so you get the refraction uh, from the uh, unpaved lane. Then that's not the dot totally refracts the uh, compaction under the uh, fresh compacted payment um, side. So that's not, you will not get uh, good results from that's the uh, from density assessment and then and longitudinal joint. So that's why we place this sensor uh, about six inches away, six inches away from joint. But actually the radius of the footprints is about four inches. Uh, I will talk about how do we, how do we come up with that's four inches. But for the conservative side, we place the sensor about six, in, six inches away from joint. So here is the, just to give you a visualization, here's how we do the data collection on the joint. So we do 100% coverage on longitudinal joint to push the card from beginning of project to the end of project. So once you, once you uh, push the card on the payment, then on the screen, on the computer screen, you can instantaneously see the high and the low uh, compaction area. And you can then you can, from what, what our experience, those high and the low dash constant um, area relates to density very well. The low dash constant area relates, uh, give you the low density, and the high dash constant area give you a high density. Um, like I mentioned before, um, the, we place sensor about six inches away from joint, and so actually the the radius of the footprint of the of GPI is, is about four inches. So how did we come up with that's the four inches? This is what we did. We know the metal plate is um, metal is 100% refractor, and any wave sees the metal plate is 100% uh, refracted back. So knowing this, so we place the metal plate. Uh, we start the metal plate about two feet away from center of the antenna. Uh, we're also monitoring the output from from uh, GPR antenna. So we gradually move this metal plate to the center of the antenna. And once we once the GPR detects the edge of metal plate, we know there's the jump under the output from antenna. So we're monitoring the output of antenna. At at one point, uh, we saw there is uh, as a big jump on the antenna reading. So we know at this point, metal uh, the antenna detect the edge of metal plate. So we measured the distance from edge of metal plate to the antenna, and that was about four inches. 
but actually there is equation you can use to get estimate too, and it's called phase room size uh, estimation. So at the 12 inch height of antenna, then we use this equation and estimate it's about 3.8 inches, the radius. So it's match is pretty good, very close to our experimental uh, uh, results. So that was the first challenge we, uh, we figured out. And another challenge we had when we first got the equipment is calibration. So next we get any piece of testing equipment, the first thing we want to know whether or not this equipment can give us uh, the value of what it says, right? So for this DPH system, uh, the measure is actually constant. So we want to um, make sure this DPH system give the correct dietary constant. So we find a piece of plastic material, we call the HDPE, and this is the uh, HTPE material. The ACTM reported that the dash constant range for this piece of material is between 2.3 and the 2.35. So the range is 0 0.05 dash constant. So we know it's very tight range. So we know this material is quite uniform material. So this was the first generation of the DPS system from JSSI. So we took the measurements uh, using this uh, first generation DPS system and this material. Then we got results were outside of the range of of this uh, reported the um, uh, the ASTM, uh, ASTM reported the range of this piece of material. And so we talked with GSSI and GSSI made some improvement under the system. Then when we get the second generation of the of the DPA system, then we did the test again. Then the all within the three since all within this uh, range. So, which gives us confidence on this type of system um, for the future use. And also, we found out the first generation DPS system is much more uh, scared, giving much more scattered data. It's not as stable as the second generation system. A, a, a little bit um, mean that history on evaluating this uh, DPS system. Uh, we first got this DPS system in back in the 2015, the winter time from Shop 2 assistant program. So this is the first generation, this first uh, uh, DPS system we got is push card type system. And uh, um, if you push this card on one two mile uh, project, and it's not a big deal. Remember, we have to push this card back and forth behind the, the fancy roller. If you talk about a one mile, project probably you, you walk distance probably it's about three or four miles of that day but if you uh try to use this system on 10 or 12 20 mile project uh 20 mile project then that's quite a bit of walking distance so um that's that's very labor intensive so considering that and actually that was the feedback we got from contractor so we uh tried to put this dps system under the on the vehicle so we got the vehicle mounted system back in the 2017. Uh, this reduced the labor intensity, but um, imposed another challenge for the driver. So like, uh, like I said, we we'll want to particularly, we we'll want to put this sensor, the far left sensor on the uh, close to the joint, six, six inches away from joint. And it's very difficult for the driver to control uh, this sensor uh, six inches away from joint. But we tried different techniques to try to improve the accuracy. We mounted a, a, a video camera on the side of the van, and we put another screen on the, on the uh, beside on the side of the driver, and so try to um, try to try to let the driver to see the joint very well. And but that imposed uh, another issue is a safety issue. Um, because the driver, some people mentioned about drivers supposed to drive the vehicle straight forward, look at the, look at the uh, front, um, not look at the screen, and also as a safety issue, as a likelihood to maybe get a, if a big vehicle in on the construction side, maybe likelihood get hit by the uh, traffic. So we abandoned this idea. Now we are moving to the gear type um, uh, DPS system. So we mounted the DPS system on the one gator on the back of the gator then we'll we we'll also put the motor on on the back back of the gator we we'll move these two antenna uh, from left to right back and forth and to get the full coverage and on the payments and the gator is moving straight forward and these two antenna move from left to right right to left 
and to try to get the full coverage and, and the payment. And this far left antenna will stay stationary and to get the 100% coverage and the S and the 92G joint. So we're still working on this prototype and Kyle will uh, probably will show you a, a movie on this uh, video on this um, on this gator uh, data acquisition system. So the next generation DPS system, we're working with University of Minnesota right now. Also, we're doing the in-house research is put this uh, gator, uh, put DPS on the uh, robot. So we will let the robot do the, all the work, do the walking, and we're just using computer to control the uh, robot, the data, data collection. Where do, want, where do we want the robot to go? We can fully control it by the computer. In terms of field evaluation um, history, so we started the field evaluation um, back in the 2016. And over the past uh, four or five years, we collect the data uh, over probably over, over 20 or 30 projects. And through the data collection, we gained more experience on this, uh, in this equipment. And at the same time, we found some issues and problems, um, particularly software side. Uh, we'll work, continue to work with GSSI, try to get, it, get this in the system improved. Um, back in the 2018, um, we started to hire the contract to collect data for us. And the way we did that is to uh, pay the contract uh, to co collect the data for us. Uh, we thought um, by giving them incentives to, to collect the data for us, and also we can educate them this technology. And try to get get them excited, accept, acceptable to this technology for the future implementation. So back in the 2019, and we also published the actual spec, and this spec is for the equipment uh, acceptance, equipment uh, the uh, specifications. So start from this year, uh, we're going to try a new program called the pilot rental or buy program. And previously, we loaned the, our equipment to the contractor to collect the data for us, and also pay them by hourly rate um, to collect the data for us. So from start from this year, uh, we, we're going to ask the contractor to uh, go out, get the own equipment, either through the rental program or the buy or buy the equipment, whatever they want to do. But we're going to pay them by the amount of the data um, to give to us, we are going. We develop the draft spec. We're going. To, we're going to give this draft spec to the contractors. And if you follow this format and collect the data for us, then we'll pay the amount of data you uh, you give to us. Uh, actually, one of our local contractors uh, bought their own equipment, which is very uh, encouraging to us. So lastly, I just want to mention a little bit of the pool fund study. And so uh, some of you probably know we're working on the pool fund study and, and the DPS system. And this project started, uh, started in the January of 2020 last year, and it is a three years project. And actually this is a continuation of a SHARP2 uh, effort. Uh, like I mentioned before, SHARP2 identified the GPR is the most promising tool and that can be used for assessing the compaction uniformity and the density. But at that time, there's still a lot of work remains needs, needs to be done. Like the software was not very user friendly. And uh, at that time, we did not have actual spec in terms of data collection and analysis. We need to develop the actual spec so every people can follow the uh, spec to use this technology. But Shop 2 round up the um, round up, run out of the uh, fund, funding money uh, about three or four years ago. And actually, Steve Cooper from Federal Highway was leading and as a system program. So um, back about three years ago, and Steve and I talked about how to keep this momentum going and they don't know, so we don't get this effort wasted. It looks like GPR is very promising technology. So then we talk about the, the um, maybe we can initiate the pool fund to keep this momentum going. So we, we started the pool fund initiation about two years ago, and, and now it's fully funded in, the last, uh, in January 2020. So we're now we got the 12 states participating in the pool fund plus federal highways. So I have 13 agencies financially contributed this, to this pool fund study. 
and besides the financial contributing agencies, we also invited some other agencies to join the pool fund study, like the Alaska, Florida, and the Nebraska. They have equipment and they just don't have funds at that at, that, at this point to join the study, but uh, they have quite a bit of experience uh, on this technology and uh, they can contribute uh, to this uh, pool fund study. So we invite them as technical contributing agency. Uh, our goal is to um, move this technology, uh, move forward, and try to get the software, software as easy as possible and to technician level to use and to get uh, implemented in near future. So our objectives is to for this pool fund is to further improve, advance this DPS system. We work we're working with the JSSI to further improve this system and also support communications and also provide a training and the technical, technical assistance to the states and others to, to for this system. So if you need any technical assistance or uh, um, uh, need help from us, just let us know. We're happy to help you out. And also uh, promoting the DPS, uh, this technology to other vendors and consultants and also the local government. Uh, around these objectives, we form the seven tasks under, under this pool fund study. I'm not going to go through these uh, details on these each tasks, but if you um, come into our 14th meeting, there's another meeting on the 14th of April. I'm going to talk a little bit of details on this specifically for this pool fund study. But we built, uh, we developed the website. Um, specifically for this pool fund study and on the bottom here is the uh, website address. So we developed the training videos and then the training videos is on, the, the, on this website. And also there are draft uh, testing protocols, data analysis protocols on this website too. And also we have uh, quite a bit of publications and previously uh, we'll also pop, put on this website. So if you want to learn more about this, uh, this uh, pool fund, and then um, just go to this website and uh, you will find more information from that from there. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, everyone. So I will pass to Kyle. I will stop my sharing and uh, Kyle can talk about the um, our experience. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Yeah. And in the next section, um, we want to talk about advantages of the dielectric profiling system compared to conventional means uh, and from a state perspective. And we have we actually have three different states providing uh, their perspectives. First is going to be Kyle Ho from Minnesota, and then uh, we'll move on to Rich Geisel from Alaska, and then finally Craig Landefeld from Ohio. Kyle? Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. Um, first of all, uh, in addition to uh, Mercedes, who's been taking the lead on field collection, and then uh, Dr. Dai, who's been <clears throat> leading this effort. I wanted to briefly mention how great it is to work with the uh, uh, support of the pooled fund states. Uh, Craig, not just Craig and um, Rich, who you'll hear from later today, but uh, Amy Basie from North Dakota and Thomas Kane and from New York and a lot of others are really active and it's a, a fun group to be a part of and uh, I appreciate their support. And then of course management at MnDOT, Glenn uh, Engstrom and Kurt Turgeon and Jeff Brunner and uh, Steve Cooper and the FHW, FHWA have made this effort uh, successful uh, and a lot of fun to do. So. Uh, I'm going to get right into the advantages of the density profiling system as we see it uh, from MnDOT. And uh, I thought Dr. Brown did a great job uh, speaking about the importance of adequate density and um, not just how it affects the pavement performance, but how this type of information can be used to actually improve and get better density just by uh, evaluating some of the different construction practices. So I stole this little uh, pinwheel from Rebecca Embacher from our uh, Advanced Materials Technology Unit. I thought it did a good job explaining with some other intelligent construction technologies all the different things that are affected by the data that we're collecting. And uh, specifically for the 
density profiling systems, uh, some of the advantages are that it can be collected right behind the final roller. So you have a display real time with continuous coverage uh, that at a minimum is outputting your relative compaction effort if you're just directly outputting the dielectrics where higher dielectrics are better compaction, lower dielectrics are worse compaction for that specific mix. But now we're even moving as Di alluded to towards just directly outputting the voids based on the calibrations for that specific mix on that specific day. So that's where I want to start uh, with, uh, you know, one area where we see a huge advantage of the DPS technology is that ability to convert directly to uh, air voids and to be able to do that without cutting any cores in your pavement. And we've developed uh, a series of training videos that uh, were originally developed for the 1.0 uh, unit last year uh, that we're in the process of converting to uh, compatible with 2.0 and then adding some uh, additional uh, things from the lessons we've learned over the past year through the pooled fund. Uh, but the first one I just wanted to briefly touch on here is uh, how simple it is to actually fabricate the pucks that you need to be able to do the calibration. So. Um, MnDOT and I'm sure other states have to make quality assurance cores or, or sorry, quality assurance pucks uh, for the production mix at predefined periods throughout the day uh, anyway. So one thing we've done and we're advocating through the, the pooled fund is to also uh, fabricate a medium voids and a high voids uh, air void content puck in addition to the design voids uh, puck pucks that are made uh, each day and that gives us our full range of voids that we should uh, see throughout the paving day and, and allows us to calibrate uh, what each dielectric value should correspond to in terms of the actual voids when you take this technology out in the field and uh, this process the the past construction season was actually completed by the contractor just on the on-site uh, lab just grabbing a couple uh, pails of mix and, and fabricating these pucks. And then uh, the other part of this I wanted to touch upon is that we can actually get our dielectric measurement uh, in the lab uh, on site. And the reason that's nice is that as soon as the um, pucks are fabricated and extru extruded from the forms, uh, you can just directly take this puck testing kit and measure the dielectric of uh, the the specimens. And I took a couple screenshots from the video that uh, we shot a month ago that we're going to release uh, here shortly with the, uh, the new puck testing uh, kit procedure. And what we have here is specimens one, two, and three corresponding to the design voids, medium voids, and, and high voids. Uh, um, samples and then the procedure uh, that you need to follow with the equipment to be able to get your corresponding dielectric values and and one thing that i'm going to highlight here is that the height or the puck thickness it turns out based on our experience last year is a really critical um, input to be able to get a good um, dielectric measurement and and the reason i'm highlighting that uh, is that there has been some instances of bias between what we're getting with our puck measurements to convert dielectric to air void versus uh, what we're seeing when we actually cut the cores in the field. For us, we didn't see that happening too often, uh, but the current working theory that we're looking at is making sure that the, uh, the puck thickness that's used uh, is of high accuracy. And so right now we're advocating to to use the direct readout from the gyratory compactor at at each of the uh, at the end of the test for each of the the different samples you make, but then also uh, have a validation uh, puck height uh, apparatus that we're going to plan on using to verify that that the thickness that's input is actually uh, accurate in terms of the actual puck thickness. But this is DPS 101, so I'm going to try not to get in. To too many details here with the the process itself so uh the long story short here is that once you've completed those um 
steps in the in the lab uh, with the puck testing kit, you can just directly output it to either Excel or the PaveScan software that you have on site doing your your data collection uh, measurements. And and what that does for you is is basically tells the uh, equipment uh, exactly what uh, air void content or percent max density you're seeing when you're taking your measurements out in the field. And one thing that we're doing certainly it, while we're researching this technology is to not just blindly trust that this curve that we create uh, shown in the in the um, orange dots here and corresponding regression linear regression line, but actually validating that that's what we're seeing when we actually cut cores below our dielectric measurements in the field. So what you see here with all these uh, gray dots are the results of actual field dielectric measurements taken prior to the core getting cut. And uh, what we were able to accomplish this past construction season is to just piggyback on the cores that needed to be taken anyway uh, for our normal quality assurance uh, validation process. And so we were able to to basically report when we're going out to the districts or asking contractors if they're interested in this technology that you don't have to take any extra cores when you use this technology. And that's one thing that I've learned is that nobody likes taking cores. And that's a big uh, selling point for this technology that uh, as it stands right now, you can get a conversion to uh, void content without cutting any holes in your pavement. And now at this point, we just need those cores to validate that our conversion is actually correct or not. So you can imagine collecting these 10 to 15 cores per day that we're currently uh, using for quality assurance are not no longer gonna be necessary. You know, maybe we can reduce that to five per day or even less depending on how uh, the technology performs, but that's a huge uh, direction of improvement that uh, potentially can be a product of of moving towards quality assurance with this technology itself beyond the the obvious one, which is the improved coverage of the technology. And and we've been able to uh, use this method uh, fairly robustly in in the sense that we had 28 unique paving days and over 266 validation cores testing out this process itself. And with the pooled fund, we're going to continue to be able to uh, evaluate and, and improve on this uh, process. And, and the goal is to be able to eliminate the bias uh, enough to the point where we can start using this technology for quality assurance. So uh, that allows us to get to the fun part. So, so basically all the talk before was, you know, how do we make sure that what we're actually measuring out there is reflective of the compaction? Um, and then once we have that process done, now what we're effectively out there doing is getting a continuous coverage that gives us all the information that you'd get from cutting holes in the pavement without actually cutting the holes in the pavement. And uh, as Di alluded to, we've been looking at different techniques uh, for data collection. And, and the first one we're looking at here uh, that was just actually developed towards the end of last year was a gator mounted system where as long as you have this um, strap dragging along your longitudinal joint, you have 100% coverage at the center line joint, and then the other two remaining sensors are moving back and forth to get your full coverage at approximately 10, 12 foot spacing along the entire uh, pavement width. And that's just one way we're looking at collecting uh, the data, but it's still a, a, a process that we're looking at and getting input from our construction or our pavements office as well as other states uh, and determine exactly you know what type of coverage is the most effective at providing information about the placed uh, mat but one thing that dr brown touched upon and and that you know everybody seems to agree is getting that center line joint uh i think that 1090 rule sounds uh, uh, like a good general rule of thumb where basically if we can get our, our joint figured out, even though it's 10% or less of the pavement, it's where 90% of the early uh, failures occur. So that's, that's one thing that we want to focus on with our um, collection. And I think 
Michael said he was going to put this YouTube link here in the comments so you can. Uh, I know when you share screen, it kind of uh, skips sometimes so you can see the, the YouTube video. And please, uh, if you have an issue with the background music, it was Kurt Turgeon's idea. So uh, go ahead and email him and tell him how much you don't like the music and give him suggestions. I'm sure he'll like to to get a bunch of emails explaining what was wrong with his music selection on our YouTube video here. So this next one is just showing uh, what we do for a static data collection. And the, pur the purpose of this one is uh, to just give us an idea to make sure that if these different sensors are going along the exact same spot of pavement, they should give you the exact same result. And that's one thing we've learned through initial trials is that you got to make sure that all three of your sensors are in spec of each other. And that's something we've had to accomplish through swerve or line tests in the past. But I think this uh, bracket mounted system should give us a little bit of um, uh, ease, a little more ease in terms of getting the information we need to make sure these sensors are calibrated to each other. So, so basically that moves us closer to having an acceptable dielectric quality assurance test that's easy to uh, accomplish. Uh, Di also mentioned that we're moving uh, towards robotics uh, with the University of Minnesota and evaluating an in-house system. Uh, where we're currently at with that is uh, inputting uh, coordinates basically based on the alignment file of the project and then telling the uh, the robot to go from one station to another at a specific offset from the joint and uh, the University of Minnesota has been able to simulate that with the physics of our specific um, robot embedded into this uh, simulation program and the plan for this summer is to uh, to get it out on an actual construction site and in that case we want to collect uh, infrared data because as you know, the alignment files are based on the planned uh, paved location, and we want to be accurate enough so that we're identifying exactly where the pavement joint is to be able to to move the robot along uh, behind the final roller. And and some of the attractive things about the robot is the increased safety of not having a person close to the longitudinal joint, and uh, some of the specifications to make sure if we're going to use this data for quality assurance that uh, it's not exposed to the bias of of the person who's actually pushing the cart, especially if you're going to have the contractor push the cart or collect the data you're going to use for uh, quality assurance. Uh, and then also potential for pre-programming the core validation locations and an initial challenge with the robot will be making sure that it um, stays away from the final rollers, but that could also be an advantage down the road, especially if the rolling becomes uh, uh, robotic or automated too. Uh, you can imagine a system where there's a feedback loop between the final roller compactors and the uh, DPS units that are giving information about the compaction result. So uh, the last um, I guess advantage that I want to attack this from is how it fits in with other intelligent construction technologies. And I want to just use an example that I think highlights uh, the real time feedback and ability of this uh, device to monitor how the process changes actually affect uh, the achieved density. And, and the way we look at it at MnDOT is that you have all this information about um, the process, so where your rollers are, um, what the temperature when each of the of the mat when each of the rollers hit it is, and and all these different process pieces of information, but we're still relying on uh, cores to give us our end result uh, compaction, and I think that's really where this DPS technology fits in, and and some of these things like modifying rolling patterns or adding additional rollers or not, this real time feedback can come into play. Uh, to help give us information to, to make those decisions. So this uh, project that I'm going to highlight here was actually a 13 mile project where the contractor did quite frankly pretty awesome. It was a super paved five mix and they were typically hitting between 94 to 97 percent uh, on average. That's shown in the 
yellow along this stretch of pavement here. Um, and the cores were confirming uh, this good job, but we did have about a half mile stretch starting at station 390 where we had kind of this drop down to around 90 to 93 percent uh, compaction in, in areas. So the question is what what's different in this this spot here on the pavement than we were seeing for the majority of of the project itself. And uh, um, the other intelligent construction technologies showed both pass count and temperature on the initial compaction effort. And uh, what we saw, in fact, was a, a discrete change exactly in the area where we saw the drop in our achieved density, uh, shown here in green on the density profiling system, uh, and red with a lack of passes, and yellow and, and orange from the, the pass count results. And then in blue here for the temperature at initial uh, compaction. So uh, it's great to have all this data, but the question is, well, you know, if it's something this large, you would think our, our cores would also catch that too, right? So uh, we, we took a look at the cores that uh, occurred along this location. And uh, unfortunately, at our current coring uh, quality assurance um, procedure, there were zero cores on the eastbound lane where this dropped uh, occurred, or starting at around 390, uh, st uh, station 390. But luckily, we were able to get uh, at least one core here in the westbound lane uh, over on this side of the pavement uh, along this area. But uh, unfortunately, that, that spot of the pavement actually showed pretty good compaction. So we thought, well, okay, maybe the technology, the DPS, uh, was giving us the wrong results. But in that specific spot, we hit 95.1% uh, predicted compaction, which was pretty close to the 95.9 that the core showed. And then we also looked at the, the actual data in that area itself, uh, also showing pretty good compaction there. So that kind of brings us to um, uh, some of the improvements that have been done on a software level that should help us to get more real-time feedback for catching these sort of low spots. And so some of those improvements in include, we used to have to go back into MATLAB to filter the data and output the stations or offsets we wanted, but now it's part of the on-site software where you can say, okay, I want to look just at this problem area starting at 388 uh, all the way to station 410. And I just want to look at the pass that's giving me a random sample of the mat, uh, press play, and then you got the data filtered uh, the way you want it. And it looks a little bit messy, but it's actually pretty intuitive here. What you have on the top is your stationing, and then what you have here on the y-axis down on the bottom being 90% compaction and the top 95% compaction. And lo and behold, that core location at around station uh, 393 uh, was showing around 95% uh, compaction uh, in that area. And you say, well, maybe we just got a little bit unlucky with the cores uh, this time. So you can also look at it here with a uh, histogram, which basically gives you a count at each of these different uh, compaction levels of how many data points or how many measurements at each of those compaction levels did we see. And uh, what you see here at the core level actually was in a spot where you were most likely more than any other level of compaction to actually see uh, uh, that higher compaction there. But you also have all this data uh, at these low spots within this known problem area that are not at adequate uh, compaction. So uh, I think one thing to, to come away from with this continuous coverage technology is, you know, the assumptions we're using right now to evaluate compaction quality are probably need to be adjusted. And, and that's, you know, not a comment that's critical of what we're doing with cores because, you know, when you can only cut 10 to 15 cores in your pavement uh, per day, uh, you're not able to do these kind of assessments. But but I do think if we're able to get this technology reliable enough for quality assurance, it really changes how we want to start looking at our pavements and, and really iron 
out and look into these uh, dips and and uh, decreased spots in in compaction that we otherwise can't evaluate when we're evaluating with cores. And and one thing I wanted to just briefly mention is that, that what looks like noise hey, here when hey, you look Kyle, at it, we're uh, we have two more presentations left. Just a reminder. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll go through the last part quickly here. So so these spots that look like noise, if you zoom in on them, uh, they're actually representative of, of the area uh, within that section of the pavement. And uh, and and really, when we start to iron this out and import everything together in one software, uh, you can you can really iron out exactly what's happening with the process that's causing these drops or these dips or these problem areas with with the pavement. So uh, and and again, there's another area where a lack of passes causes the the drop in the pavement compaction. So uh, these are just a, a summary of of the four bullet points that we went through about uh, the advantages of DPS uh, from Mindot's um, uh, perspective. But uh, at this point, I'd like to pass it back to Brian so we can go to the other presentations. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, next up, we have a, a pre-recorded presentation from Rich Geisel from Alaska DOT. Hello, I'm Rich Geisel. Today, it is my pleasure to talk with you about the advantages gained from using a dielectric profiling system, or DPS, for mapping compaction of asphalt pavements. The number one reason for using the dielectric profiling system is that it lets you see the entire compaction picture. It's like having x-ray vision for asphalt paving. In the 10 to 15 minutes it takes to set up and drill one core, the DPS operator can collect 40,000 readings, one for every square foot of surface on a 3,300 feet long lane segment. Random spot tests rarely find defects. Full coverage testing, like this infrared camera image, rarely miss a defect. Please read the Burmeister quote with me. The primary problem is not so much to determine the average conditions as it is to make reasonably certain that possibly the most unfavorable conditions are known. Donald Burmeister, 1948. When spot testing was all we had for measuring asphalt compaction, statistical measures of quality made sense. An average value of compaction was about the best measure we could get from 8 to 10 drilled cores. Continuous full coverage with the dielectric profiling system makes us reasonably certain that the most unfavorable conditions are known, fulfilling Burmeister's vision from 73 years ago. Better compaction uniformity has a huge ripple effect on overall pavement quality. Uniformly compacted pavements give longer pavement life, lower maintenance cost, and a smoother ride. DPS data can be used for uniformity incentives or disincentives. Increasing compaction is the easiest and cheapest way to increase pavement fatigue life. The dielectric profiling system provides assurance of uniform high compaction. This example is for a typical Alaska superpave mix designed for 1 million easels at a target compaction level of 94.7%. Increasing compaction by 3 tenths of 1% to 95% increases fatigue life by 13%. Increasing compaction by 1.3% to 96% increases fatigue life by 55%. Increasing compaction by 2.3% to 97% increases fatigue life by 97%. Nearly double the fatigue life with one or two more roller passes. For defect mapping, user selects minimum compaction value, target compaction value, and area of defects for export as CSV files or spreadsheets or KML files for visual display with Google Earth. 
with continuous full coverage compaction mapping on the mat, no pothole left behind can become a reality. With good communication, systemic compaction problems, like this one adjacent to a paved shoulder, can be resolved quickly. On this mill and fill project, the roller operator was making a pretty edge joint by lapping the roller onto the old paved shoulder. We did not want pretty. We wanted well compacted. Keeping the roller on the hot mat for passes two and three is required for edge compaction. Sometimes paving has to be done in adverse conditions. When summer arrives, you might want to see how well you did. Forensic testing can be done on a pavement of any age. This is the computer compression of 3,500 feet of dielectric data on the Glacier Highway. Stations 82 to 98 were paved in cold weather with a rain event at station 90. Stations 98 to 117 were paved nearly a month earlier in warmer weather. So what do these dielectric readings mean in terms of compaction? Calibration for this forensic work required drilling four cores after dielectric mapping with the DPS system. Bulk density of the cores was plotted against dielectric readings taken at core locations prior to drilling. After calibration, we see the exact same pattern. Low dielectric equals low compaction. But now compaction values are displayed instead of dielectric. Would you prefer 18,000 compaction readings on this 1,500 feet of lane one or one core? Area defects are exported to KML files for viewing as shown in this image. The photo clearly shows where roller operators turned off vibration as they approached the bridge. Prior to use of DPS, we were not aware that we were leaving bridge overlays below minimum compaction levels because we never core on a bridge. A good match segment looks like this on the PaveScan computer. The histogram shows that all readings are greater than 92%. Mat compaction defects are also exported to CSV files where they can be listed by station. The exported data is shown in blue font in the first six columns. I added the defect area calculation in red font in the last column. Minimum defect area was eight square feet. Continuous full coverage compaction mapping at longitudinal joints is a huge leap forward in QCQA. Pavement life is limited by the weakest link, almost always the longitudinal joints. Scanning across and along the joints with the dielectric profiling system allows us to see variations we could never see before. It's like looking at a living cell through a microscope for the first time. For this 14,000 feet of longitudinal joint, would you prefer to have 28,000 compaction values or five cores? Continuous full coverage compaction mapping gives you a complete compaction picture along longitudinal joints. This screenshot shows great joint compaction. One station of 200 compaction values is displayed as a heat map at top and a line chart at the bottom. The smaller graph at the bottom of both images shows entire extent of data, station 1080 to 1150 with the smaller portion display, station 1103, shown shaded between the handlebars. For longitudinal joints, agency can enter minimum compaction value, target compaction value, and minimum length of defects into export defects table. These parameters will set defect boundaries for export of CSV files to spreadsheets or KML files to Google Earth for visual display. 
A list of linear defect locations and station order is also generated when the export defects button is activated. This is what the dielectric profiling system technician sees while mapping poor joint compaction. The data streams into view at the right of the screen when traveling in the increasing station direction. A heat map is in the top panel and a line chart is in the bottom panel. Alternately, a histogram may be displayed in the bottom panel as we saw in an earlier slide. Export button created a KML file of linear, low compaction defects that produced this Google Earth image. Compaction below 91% for four feet or more with the user selected parameters for longitudinal defects on this project. Joint defects are mapped in red. Linear defects are exported as CSV files for direct use in spreadsheets. The linear defects CSV file shown in Buffon was directly pasted into the first five columns of this XLS spreadsheet. I added the calculation of defect length shown in red font in the last column. I saved the most important point for last. Vehicle mounted DPS systems collect robust compaction data without exposing unprotected workers to traffic. I would like to finish with this picture of a happy future taxpayer, knowing DPS technology will be saving her money by assuring higher quality, longer lasting roads and highways. Thank you very much. And last this morning, uh, we have Craig Landefeld from Ohio DOT giving Ohio's uh, perspective. Craig? Can you hear me there, Brian? Got you loud and clear, Craig. All right, let me see if I can adjust things here. That should be giving you the presentation. Are you good to go? Looks good. All right, great. So I'm just gonna, you know, quickly here go over a few advantages we've seen in Ohio um, as we've started looking at this technology and maybe a little background or things to think about as to why we're interested in it um you know and what the future we see for the technology and, and why we're uh, kind of uh, pushing this along so i first thought i was i came up with when i was uh when you think about you know what the advantages are you know is why do we care about this and and uh, what can we solve here and i'm sure that you know most states are, are similar to ohio you see a lot of defects in your pavements over time and you know for us some of these defects that we really care about are the ones that you know we're, we're building in because we see those as you know defects that we could eliminate during construction we just knew they were there um, and we could eliminate these problems from from popping up in the future and causing some premature distress so here's a few pictures of some defects that you know we've seen in our pavements some of these are you know, a little bit more severe than than others, but you can see some you know longitudinal joint failures where we've went in and milled and replaced uh, material on the longitudinal joint. Had some you know pavements here that's got some debonding and raveling and some some different defects. But similarities between all these pavements are that all these pavements at the time of construction, nobody noticed anything wrong with them. Um, you know, at the end of construction, the uh, Contractor got paid. We, you know, moved on with the project, and then here we fast forward. And some of them were alarmingly early. Some of them were maybe more in an expected time frame. But certainly, we could have got more life out of these pavements had had some of these defects not came and caused us some issues. So some of the defects are obvious. You know, some of these things are easy to see. Um, you know, you don't have to be experienced or even an a pavement engineer or anybody in the industry to look at some of these pavements and go something doesn't look right here something's something's off um, and and you know hopefully we handle these um, I know on even some of our projects uh, you know we we see that our staff maybe doesn't even handle these defects that are visually obvious uh, the way we would like um, and expect uh, certainly not the 
not the contractor on a couple of these projects, but you know, we, we go in, we can take gauges, we can measure things, you know, we we know the issues with density, we know the performance loss that you know we're gonna see if we you know allow these defects to to remain to you know be built and incorporated into the project. Um, but I guess the question that we keep coming up with is, you know, as we see these pavements that are constructed, a lot of times these defects aren't obvious. You know, we look at this mat here, it's a pretty good looking mat. Are there any defects there? Is there anything there that's going to come back and cause us a problem? And, you know, quite honestly, we say we don't know. You know, we take, you know, in Ohio, we would take about 10 cores a day. That's our, our standard, um, you know, coring scheme for, for our density specification. And they're spaced out so far that you have no idea whether there are, you know, defects that are waiting to cause you some problems. So trying to just take a, an example as to what some of these things might cost. Um, in Ohio, we kind of have a, a rule of thumb, you know, from a lot of our uh, district pavement staff that, you know, they think they're repairing somewhere around 5% of the uh, pavement area mid-cycle um, on most of our pavements. And, um, you know, some are more, some are less, but they think they average right around 5%. So if we looked at our annual resurfacing program for calendar year 2021, we'd be right around 2,400 lane miles. Um, we'd be looking at replacing. And so we're talking about a, a tune of maybe $30 million that we could save if we could eliminate all those repairs. Uh, we look at kind of our average costs as we go through there. Certainly we're, we would never be able to eliminate everything, but you know, it's a significant dollar figure that we could save if we could, you know, eliminate you know half of these repairs, even um, you know, roughly fifteen dollars, fifteen million dollars annually that we could use for you know other purposes. Um, when we start to look at our loss of service life, this is where the numbers start to increase, you know, pretty dramatically as well. You know, our preservation program here at ODOT's roughly in the six hundred and fifty million dollar a year range. Um, average pavement life for a for a surface for us is going to be somewhere in the ten to twelve year horizon. Um, so if we look at that and we can get an extra year out of these pavements by improving the construction quality, um, you know, we could be at a 55 to maybe even a $65 million per year savings um, just by being able to, to boost our life and, and get one more year out of our pavements. So, you know, the dollars are significant. This is, you know, why we're interested in it. Um, so, you know, as we as we go through these things, you think, you know, what can I do with $65 million? Um, you know, there's a, a couple of yachts and a and a Gulf Stream that you could buy, but you know we could we could build an interchange. We could um, you know do maybe six to ten miles of of new four lane pavement. Um, there's a lot of things that we could do if we could save sixty five million dollars every year that would just advance our program and, and make our system better. So these are that's why we're interested. Um, all the other speakers have touched a lot about the, the RDM, so I won't get into some of the, the basics too deep here, but you know, the benefits are the continuous measurements. Um, you know, it's non-destructive, the results can come back, come back faster. You know, Rich just alluded to the amount of samples. Um, you know, our typical coring scheme in Ohio is gonna result in 10 cores representing roughly 2,000 tons every day um, when we put that material down. Um, you know, if we look at the RDM sampling rate, you know, that's 54,000 samples in that same 2,000 tons. So, Rich said, what would you rather have? Well, 10 cores or, or 54,000 readings? Um, you know, I, I think we all would, would uh, and Matt, uh, always jump to the, to the higher sample rate there. You know, and to kind of put that in perspective, you know, what what does 10 cores? Well, core for us, four inch core, you know, about the size of a hockey puck. You know, that's almost four football fields. And in Ohio, we think of everything about the Buckeyes. So, you know, we've got Ohio Stadium there. So I guess just some other things to consider. Um, you know, we've had some questions from some of our contractors and some others, you know, can we really believe the the results of this machine? And and people are um, you know, skeptical at first, and and I don't blame them. We we ought to, um, you know, look into these things. Or certainly, you know, we're talking about big dollars here. We don't want to, um, 
to do anything that's going to have uh, a worse correlation or or um, you know not be able to accurately measure what we're after out there. So we put it in perspective and looked at some uh, research projects that we'd seen um, different ones along the way on gauge correlations to to density, whether they were nuclear or we allow the PQI gauges, uh, the electric gauges here in Ohio. Um, and then there's some other, you know, the PAVE tracker and some other technologies that we wouldn't get into here. But you can see the different, you know, correlation values for the R squared here, you know, roughly 0.8 for a nuclear gauge, 0.8182. Um, less with a PQI. We've seen other data that suggests that uh, maybe the PQI could be a little higher under certain conditions from some research that we've done um, here in Ohio. But, you know, pretty accepted technology, nuclear gauges, most of our contractors believe the results they get from their nuclear gauge, and we're running at a 0.82 roughly R squared value. Um, you know, our experience with the RDM has resulted in our average R squared value being right around 0.88. Um, some of the best being up at 0.99, kind of almost unbelievable results that we've seen, you know, using this equipment. So we, we think the ability is there to accurately measure this, um, you know, and, and the technology we think is is there to, to do that. Now it comes down to, you know, the devils in the details and, and some of the implementation that uh, schemes that we would have to put together to, to make it happen. So this is just, you know, some of the displays. It's pretty easy to, to take the you know data, put it in Excel. We just use some of the um, conditional formatting for some some uh, shading here to kind of give you a, a heat map look on, on Excel where you could actually look at the, uh, the data and kind of get a visual of it, you know, more linearly. Um, or you could still look at the, the number of the data. Um, you know, it also will display in Google Earth. Um, so you can look at a map, not maybe particularly useful for much other than maybe some presentations and some some graphical displays, but um, you know, some output that you can see there. Um, something else we're real excited about is the use of the VEDA software, hopefully here in the near future, as the pooled fund is uh, trying to advance that. And we'd actually have some, some software and some more powerful analysis tools that will make it a little easier to manage files and handle this data. So we move forward as well. Um, you know, here's just a typical you know, calibration curve that we'd put together with you know a nice R squared value right around 0.88 and you know a histogram showing you know the representation of some of the data that we got on the project. One of the interesting things on this project that we did was we were also using the uh, thermal profiling technology on this uh, this particular project on I-75 in Western Ohio. And um, one of the interesting things that I found was you could go in and, you know, look at the cold spots. We actually on this project required the contractor to do some in dumping. And then we also used material transfer on the project. And we were, you know, evaluating a new mixture that we were trying out that was uh, a little different gradation, trying to reduce the segregation potential. And we kind of wanted them to actually utilize in dumping and, and see how that went. And by and large, it did reduce the segregation potential um, visually out there that we saw on the road. But at truck changes, like up here, we see some of these circles on the upper left hand uh, graphic. You can see some of these cold chevron looking patterns where we've had, you know, a truck change and and the uh, cold material that was was left at that truck change. And we came back in these exact same areas and we measured them with the DPS and we can see these dips. And, we go through these dips, some of these um, green areas that we see, you know, on the right as we zoom in on the DPS, those are in the 88 to 91 percent range on density. So obviously not what we would we would like density wise. And, you know, the DPS correlated very well with the temperature data. You know, wasn't shocking, just uh, another nice validation of how we can you know, use these technologies to improve moving forward. So with that will you know kind of wrap up here, but you know we really believe that uh, this technology has some has a lot of potential. Um, there's obviously things that we need to iron out a little bit more before we're going to be ready to move forward with you know running this as our 
quality assurance tool for a project, but you know, we, we believe that there's a lot of cost savings and a lot of the performance improvements that could have some big financial impacts for us. Um, and then as Rich mentioned with the safety and you know some of the exposure times for staff and contractor staff um, when you're out on the road, um, we think there's some improvements that can can happen there. And you know, especially as we move and, and look towards vehicle mounting and some things that you know can can make it safer for everyone out there doing the work. So with that, wrap up and questions and I'll kick it back to Brian and let him handle those. Awesome. Thank you very much, Craig. So we are a little over time. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I've got a summary of questions and we'll go do just a couple of those and then wrap this up for the day. Um, of this list, uh, one I think that would be good to share in, in this particular forum is have paving contractors embraced the technology? Are they seeing benefits? And so any of our speakers, if you want to jump in and answer this, just uh, unmute yourself and um, give us your opinion. I can speak, but I went over my time, so I want to give the other speakers time to respond first if they want to. I guess in Ohio, I would say that um, our contractors are really interested in the technology. We haven't um, used this as a primary acceptance tool on any projects yet. It's all been uh, more us collecting data. And we've engaged our industry a lot. They're very interested. Uh, we get a lot of questions from technicians and, and folks who look at us collecting data on site and then asking us to go do other things for them because they're interested in something. So. Um, they're definitely interested, and I, I don't think that them embracing it's going to be an issue. They're excited about not having the cut cores. Yeah, from uh, from Minnesota experience and from my experience in, in the project, I've been on several. I was on several projects, and I from what I heard from contractors, they are very excited to talk energy as well. I mean, you can see for for the cores, um, they can't see the results, density results right away. They have to get the core results from two or three days after the paving is complete. And for this technology, you can instantaneously see the density and while you push this car behind the um, finish roller. And they are very happy on these results. They can see, oh, how, how well I did on, on the compaction. Yeah, and the only thing I would add is that the, uh, you know, one example was on echelon paving. There was two different types of um, rolling patterns that the contractor was trying out. And even with a newt gauge, just getting the spot measurements wasn't necessarily sufficient to do the evaluation with the DPS. You can get a, a, a more fully covered uh, comparison. And in that case, one of the techniques was far superior uh, to the other. And I think that kind of feedback is exciting for contractors to see. Thank you. Um, I, I thought this was another good uh, question for this group is what types of mix changes require a new calibration? And that was during your presentation, Kyle. Yeah, I'll just start quickly by saying that what we're doing as a research effort is requiring calibration every single day and um, at times more than one time per day and we're still gathering information to be able to determine exactly how much of a mix change requires a new calibration uh, so one approach to this might be to just measure only the pucks that you have to make anyway for quality assurance and don't add the medium and high void uh, and then if that shifts off your curve then then you know you need a new calibration um, but we're still kind of in the research uh, process there and wh what I can say is that if there's uh, for for a typical day to day mixes there's not a shift in the in the data that we're observing so far. So in Minnesota if a contract changes the aggregates by more than by 10 percent that they have to let us know there's a change in the mixture. So yeah one yep one example so spe specifically was when they changed from granite to limestone for the surface or from limestone to granite for the surface mix um, 
there was a, a shift in the data. So definitely your source of aggregate uh, is is affecting yeah. it. And at that time we can require the new cultivation. Thank you. Uh, the next one I'd, I'd like to get some of you to address is any generic guidance on how long to wait after a rainstorm to test the pavement with DPS if ensuring a dry or to ensure a dry surface and is subsurface moisture a concern? Um, I mean, I can jump in and, and say some of our experience has been that um, if the if the pavement looked dry, um, it was probably okay. We didn't we didn't see any any issues or any reason to go beyond that. Uh, we tested it a little bit after some the rain on purpose on a couple of projects just to see what would happen. And as soon as the pavement looked dry, it was back to you know a, a reasonable um, dielectric compared to where it was before. Um, I think with rolling and you know, hitting something immediately, that would be the best in the way we want to go for quality assurance. Um, and once the roller water was gone, everything seems to be fine. Diet and Kyle might have some more info. They've done. Yeah, we we have been collecting right after the final roller when the pavement's still a, about 150 degrees, so it tends to evaporate. And I second what Craig said, which is that as soon as it's dry on the surface, there doesn't appear to be uh, an effect of of the moisture that's either already evaporated or soaked into the pavement itself. Um, but there are times when there's like a layer for, of um, or not a layer, but a line of of moisture from the final roller getting um, uh, added water, uh, and and those do cause a spike in the in the data. And and Di could probably speak more to it. We, we've been looking into a moisture gauge as a potential way to attack that problem. Yeah, so well, we're over that and. The moisture effects of actual constant management. Actually, this is part of our pool fund study. We are looking at ideally what we want to find some device we can get a continuous assessment of moisture on the pavement surface and along with the DPAs. Uh, so far, we found one potential technology we can use for the future is the Dr. Uh, David White from uh, NGOs. And they showed us, and uh, I, I think he developed the device by himself. Is kind of uh, some lights. It lights shooting out from a sensor and and shoot on the pavement surface. When that's the lights detect the moisture locations, and then the computer show the uh, huge spike. So we we still try to work with him to develop that technology. I'm not sure how successful it was, uh, how successful he's doing right now. And we talked to him last fall. At that time, he said he still need to work on some sensitivity issue and, and the equipment, and uh, hopefully uh, we we'll get him back this year to evaluate uh, the system. Uh, at the same time, we found a moisture meter is called Flare, um, I think 60. That meter can give you spot testing on the, on the uh, spot and moisture testing on, on, on this pavement surface. So we think we can use that one for the for the density for the core um, measurements, we need to take a validation course um, on the field. So maybe we can place that's the before we extract the core from that location, we can use that motion meter to detect what's motion level on that's the core location. So these are the um, these are the things we are we're working on on the part of the uh, pool farm. And one last question, and then the remainder of the questions we will we will answer in writing and then post along with the presentations. We'll send you an email on where uh, I, I expect the presentations and are going to be posted in two different locations. Uh, but last question, if the heights of the pucks changes the correlation of dielectric constant to air voids, do variations in HMA layer thickness affect DPS readings? Do underlying layers affect the readings? Kyle, you can. I know it's got my name, but you can probably answer that a little better. Um, you know, I get into you know kind of how they're measured differently with the the, the puck measurement in the lab yeah. versus in the field. Yeah, thanks, Craig. So um, the 
puck measurements are completely different in terms of how the dielectric is extracted. So it's important not to confuse uh, when we say that the thickness of the puck is extremely important to get the dielectric when you're doing the laboratory readings. Uh, that's because we're actually measuring the dielectric based on the velocity um, and an input to the velocity is the travel distance, which equates to the, the puck thickness. So in that case, the the puck thickness is, is very critical to getting an accurate dielectric. For the surface reflection readings that we're getting in the field, uh, the thickness of the uh, lift is not a factor in terms of the calculation of the dielectric. It's just a reflection coefficient based on the the response of the top approximately inch of the material. So where that comes into play would be if you had, let's say, a thin asphalt lift on top of a material that has a different dielectric, such as uh, PCC uh, concrete, you might have an effect of an underlying layer. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, if you're applying it on new HMA, uh, either a mill and overlay or on top of a existing uh, asphalt lift, you won't have it, um, an effect of the HMA layer thickness. Uh, the only other extreme case that uh, might affect your dielectric for thickness is if you're doing a very thick lift paving where you might have a, a density gradient with depth. Uh, in that case, your your dielectric reading will be a response based on the top inch or so of the of the um, placed mat. So it would not be characterizing the the lower. Let's say if you did a really thick five inch lift, you'd you'd want to do your uh, your core air void measurement of the top inch to to calibrate with the the dielectric reading. And as part of the pooled fund, we were actually looking at a section of pavement at Min Road where we did have a, a six inch lift placed. And then we also have a section at Min Road we're looking at as part of the pooled fund where the thickness is gradually changed from three inches uh, down to zero at a transition zone. So we'll be able to give more uh, quantitative response to that question uh, as part of the pooled fund. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, do you have any closing words you want to say? Just want to say thanks again to all the presenters. I mean, very good information. Um, <laughs> really good information. And um, yeah, like uh, Brian said, we plan on Brian's going to post the PowerPoints and we'll let you know where they're posted for QES and then also through the pool fund, uh, Di and Kyle are gonna have this information posted on their site also. So we'll have two different locations where this information is available, uh, but hopefully you enjoyed today's content and uh, that's it. I appreciate it, Brian. Well, I wanna echo Steve's comments and thank all the presenters and uh, thank you all for your attendance and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Brian. Thank you guys. Thanks.